Good morning, everyone. And a beautiful morning it is. Mm. They're not of this world. They're not of this world. They're not of this world. You are not of this world. You are not of this world. Colby spoke on prayer last week. Week before that, the word, messages. I believe when I was here in November, and thank you for asking me to be here. I think you need to hold the person who asked me back responsible, not the first person. <laughs> An honest mistake. But the last time I was here, I preached on the gospel. What does the church have to offer the world? Only the gospel. If we offer them anything else, we are offering them false hope. We are offering them a poor counterfeit even of what the world is able to provide, be it entertainment, be it psychology, be it even a better way of how to live in a world that seems to be so struggling. And there are so many how-to places, and you'll feel better in thought and mind by doing this exercise or that exercise. And you can tell by the look of me I'm not an athlete and I don't exercise. <laughs> they are not of this world. And so today, I'd like to look at three passages of Scripture and dealing with the Word, God's Word. We used to be known as the people of the book. And when I talk of we, I talk of Christian church. At home, and in many places of power was the Bible. You see it from time to time, not often, but a few places sometimes you'll see the Bible. You used to see it on the table. More often than not, years ago, people would bring their Bible to church, but now we have so many other tools and mechanisms. It's amazing, isn't it, that the Bible is always there, and we can have so much close access to it. The other day, and someone in high office placed their hand on their family Bible. Did you see the size of that Bible? Put that in your pocket. <laughs> I, I don't think he had the strength to hold it. His wife had the muscles. But it had a big lock on it, didn't it? And I wondered how many times did you, would that ever been unlocked, but it was the family Bible. Dr. Fred Craddock said that we're so afraid of the Bible. Remember when we had zippers on the Bible, little packets, and he was saying that people were so afraid the word might get out, we had to put zippers on it. It might impact the world. It could scare people. People have read it and almost fainted. Is that in the Bible? Our family Bible was more of a closet for what I'd call Adam's underwear. As I, as a kid, used to press leaves in it. That was about all it ever got. It was $5 from the exhibition. And then, sometime in his 50s, after being told that he was going to hell for many years, a preacher came along by the name of Earl Old and said, no, you're going to heaven. What's going to make the difference was going to be God's Word. My dad had about a grade 5 education. I think today to read the newspaper, you require about a grade 11 education. Not too many years ago, you could read the newspaper with about a grade 7, 6 level. The Bible, New International, I think it's about uh, 11th grade. The King James is about 12th grade. My dad, I have his Bible this morning. It wasn't new to him. It was, it was old when he got it. <laughs> and his, 
held together by duct tape, and it's ugly. And it's King James, and he was trying to struggle through that. He was hungry for the word. But when you're hungry, you lead anything. And the trash and the garbage that people are consuming today, I wonder what is the state of the human soul. The word above, if you want to know what the title of the message is today. And my thought would be along these lines of read the Word and feed the Spirit. It's amazing the number of calories we consume in a day, isn't it? And how good food looks. We just don't look at our food and say, well, I'm just hungry and just, it's, it's to, you know, it, it has to be, food has to be, it does a lot of things for us now, it doesn't it have to be so entertaining. But it's good. <laughs> Mom and Dad were, they went to McDonald's over here. Perhaps I shouldn't be telling this online, but anyway, they went to McDonald's. And my mother was into things like she would go for a long run on something. Like poor Dad ate whistle dogs for about a month. And a fellow that's 250 pounds and six feet tall, he can't live on whistle dogs. No matter how much cheese you put on them, how much uh, of a hot dog you put in them, and how many you make, it just doesn't cut it. So she convinced him to try a Big Mac, and he thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. And he got just out around the corner here and driving and took a bite out of it and said, I really don't get much out of that. Oh, it had the bun on it, had the onion and the special sauce. But you know what they forgot to put in the Big Mac? The main ingredient. A Big Mac without the meat. It's uh, what's inside, isn't it? Isn't that what Jesus said? They're not of this world. When he spoke about his disciples. They're not of this world. But the church, we have to get back into the word. Yes, Colby, prayer is, is so vital. And it's so necessary. And praying churches, it, it, it just makes a whole lot of difference in our own lives, doesn't it? Never come sometimes you just have to fall to your knees and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you're there. I just have to trust you, and I do, with my life and with my soul. And where do we find that? We find that in God's Word, don't we? I remember we were in Antigua in, in, the, in the field there in the Caribbean, and the young people, they were so exuberant, and, and they used to sing the B-I-B-L-E. That's pretty old, isn't it, the Bible? And I can still, that will resonate in my head for the rest of my life. And they were singing with whole heart and whole mind, but the Bible. And what a difference that made in their lives when the young people came to Christ. They got out of a culture that, that was steeped in uh, sin. And then Christ came into their lives through the Word. And the discants were down there and proclaiming and teaching them the Word of God. And what a difference it made. And it, how much of a difference it's made in my life as well. And in the lives of those who read God's Word. Sometimes our finest hours are not our finest hours, but they are God's. I don't know how many people I had seen that week. It was just one of those weeks. I, I just, when you'd see somebody coming, I didn't see a person. I saw a problem. I, went, I hadn't shaved, and I just, I'm just going to be like Colby today. Kind of let my hair down. <laughs> be young and wild. Put the window down, let the breeze blow through my hair. So I went into Tim Hortons, and I thought, well, you know, I, I just had on my old clothes and whatever else. And, and I just sat there, and I said, I just want to have a cup of coffee. And I, I noticed three people looking at me. And uh, one of them finally came over, broken English. His name was Choi. And he had been out to the college, Maritime Christian College, but couldn't make much headway. So... I really didn't want to see anyone that day, but God said, you're going to see this fellow. So he comes over, and well, anyway, long story short, he wanted to enroll in Bible college, and Maritime Christian College was there, and he came, and he started studying. He's gone back to Korea. He's all over Asia now, and he has a program where he's having people read the Bible for two hours aloud every day. Every day. I mean, if you ask somebody in North America or Canada to read a passage of Scripture, 
That's just too much. But to be reading and to be praying hours by hour a day, we have such access to God's Word. The Word above is solid. Look at John 17 in the 17th chapter. That is a prayer chapter. Look, people say, oh, we don't read prayers. Well, if you're reading the Bible, I'm sorry, you're reading prayers. And this priestly prayer of Jesus in chapter 17 is a prayer. So if you're reading this, you're reading Scripture, but you're reading a prayer of Jesus. And this is something that has come out even of the motto of years gone by of Maritime Christian College. Remember that little logo with the little uh, torch and the little flame on it? And thy word is truth. It was King James. That's what I have this morning. And I have so many other translations, but I thought for this morning I'd use that as my dad's Bible. Thy word is truth, John the 17th chapter, and verse 17. And uh, this is what the church is known for. As I went on and I looked through the background and the history of this church, it's steeped in Scripture. This was the beginning of it, is God's Word. And if we don't have God's Word, we don't teach God's Word, and we don't sing God's Word, what are we doing? It has to be and founded upon His Word to grow spiritually. And we experience that growth, don't we? And we expand ourselves and we stretch ourselves in God's Word. We need to and we must grow spiritually. We need to be developing and filling our hearts and our minds with Christ. Because when He fills our hearts, there's no room for anything else or anyone else, is there? There's no room for anxiety. There's no room for worry. There is no room for ugliness. There is no room for despair when Christ fills our hearts. That's the assurance that we receive from His Word. And it says in that 17th verse, Thy word is truth. And today, when even as a church member, you're talking to people, you've got to be careful where they're coming from. They're not coming strictly from the teachings of the Bible. They're coming from the teachings of the culture in which we live. And that's why it was so important for Paul, wherever he went, if it was Athens or wherever, he knew the culture of the day and the culture of the people. And he said, I see that you're most religious by all of the gods that you have. It's the Word, and the Word being truth. And so today, so much of the church is in step with the culture in which it lives. And what is acceptable is just not acceptable in God's Word. There is a conflict there. And you're going to talk to somebody, well, the church is saying this, and through the decades and the centuries, this has been the teaching of the church. Or this is the teaching of the community of what's acceptable. There was at one time when you could have a discussion with somebody on pretty well any subject and have a disagreement, but you could still have a relationship and a conversation with them. The culture now is so anti-Christian. We can't not even have an opposing view. We must not just be neutral in the view of the world, we must be supportive of it. And that's how far down we have come as a society. And we are, are not careful as a church, and I mean the people of God, we will be pulled down to that level unless we know when we live by the word of God. Thy word is truth. And these, these things happened century ago when the idea come out that God is dead and there is no truth. Imagine a world without truth, and you can see it around you every day, but when we come to realize that there is truth, and that truth is found in God and in His Word, as He said, they are not of this world. In that same verse, not only is thy word truth, but sanctify them through thy word. They're set apart. You do not own you. You might say, well, this is my book, or this is my car, or this is my whatever. You don't even own yourself as a Christian. You've been set apart. Not set aside, but set apart for a purpose. 
for God's purpose. And he has placed his hands upon you for that very purpose. People looked at the temple and they say what, what a grand cathedral that temple was. And they would stand in awe of it. But it was used for a purpose, wasn't it? Same with the table in the temple, in the labor where sacrifices were being made. And all of those things were set apart for that purpose. But you have been set aside and set apart, if you will, for God's purpose. No one else's. And not for your own use or even the use of the world. They will be sanctified to be used by God and for God. Thy word is truth. Look at the little book of Hebrews chapter 4. Again there, it really gets into about the word, and it describes it here in a, a very wonderful way about how sharp the word of God is. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, and I believe it's uh, verse 2. Hmm. He says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There are words of God that go directly to the heart, don't they? Words this world needs to hear. And it begins with, you have sinned. And then God's word comes to us, doesn't it? About the truth of forgiveness. The word above, if it's solid, thy word is truth. But also the word above will sharpen. There's not to be a sense of dullness among the God's chosen but a sense of the sharpening of the Word of God. It holds the line. In other words, it doesn't change. It's hard, hard, hard to please people, isn't it? Because they'll have a criteria for you, and they'll have a measure for you, and as long as you fit in that measure, you're going to be acceptable. But what happens when they change the measure? Oh, you have to be a certain size. You have to be a certain look. You have to be of a certain agreement. You have to finish and fit into their criteria to be accepted. And young people have always struggled with that, haven't they? What they will do to be accepted. To fit in. Survey after survey has been taken. Why do people go to church? What are they looking for? Even before the word, what they're looking for is acceptance. To somebody that would care for them and take a personal interest in them and in their soul. People want to be cared for. They're not of this world. It's so easy to fit in and to be whatever somebody else wants you to be. And being a Christian doesn't mean that you're always going to fit in, does it? That means that you might be the odd one out. Be the one that's going to be somewhat different. I was brought up in a fishing village. Do you ever think that people would swear in a first fishing village? <laughs> and at that time, it was somewhat noticeable. It was, even in, in a, a small village. You know, for the most part, people didn't swear that much, but when it happened, it was good. But now it's obvious when you don't hear swearing. <laughs> Look, I would just slam the truck door and uh, lock the keys in the car. <clears throat> First reaction was, oh, no, what have I done? I went in the business, and before five people were watching me and listening, and they said, you didn't even swear. 
It's noticeable by what not is happening. And people are watching you. People are judging you. And they have a measurement, and they're judging you strictly. And not only are they judging, but you're not the target. My son-in-law last weekend preached on temptation of Christ. And it's the same thing with us today, isn't it? We're not the target. When people are condemning us, we're not the target. <laughs> Don't be such an egotist to think that it's you that they're thinking about or trying to attack. The devil is not interested in you in the sense of just making you special to tempt you alone or to bring you down or to criticize you. His target is Christ. What happens when a child can't hurt and wishes to hurt a parent? What kid hasn't wanted to punch their parent in the face? Did I say that? <laughs> it's a hate-love relationship, isn't it, sometimes? You just, i frustrated. So what do they do? I know they can't, I can't hurt this big person, but what, how I'll get at them, I'll hurt myself. Kind of an odd thinking, isn't it? And that's what Satan is doing. He's attacking Christ through us. But we've got to be armed. We've got to be prepared. And this is what the word, the word does. It holds the line because of the truth of God's word and the power that's found in it. And Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? And he was attacked. And what did he do? The word of God, wasn't it? Time after time after time. And when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came after him, again, he'd quote the scripture, wouldn't he? See, sometimes we get into battles with people about the Bible, about what it means and what you think it means. I really don't care. I don't care what it means to you. In the sense of, is it true? The criteria is, what does Jesus mean when he has said, come unto me? Everyone. It's what Jesus is saying and what he meant by that and the invitation that he offers that. And the word is sharp, it says here. In other words, it doesn't change and it is never dull. It's, it's Isn't it amazing? It even talks here about the dividing of the soul and the spirit. Illustrations are fun. I like illustrations. I love stories as well. But we had a, one of our, my fellow students at the college had an old sword. I don't know where you'd get a sword, but he had a sword. And uh, was preaching on this passage. Now, I've handled knives all of my life around fishing and whatever else. I, I, I don't like to have my fingers cut. I have one there where I just kind of lifted the skin off the knuckle and you bend it, you could see it. It's interesting how that knuckle works. But anyway, the student had the sword, and he thought about, you know, how sharp this, the word is. And he said, with the dull word, we really are not very effective. And so he takes the sword, and he puts it on his hand, and he puts it there, and he pulls it across his hand, saying the sword was dull. He looked at his hand, and it was full of blood. <laughs> it was not as dull as he had thought. We had better be careful how we use God's Word. Are we using it as a weapon against one another? Or are we using it as an instrument of Christ in His hands to battle this world? It is not dull. It keeps its edge. And it will also, as it's seen here by the sword, Look in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation about prayer was interesting. Colby's sermon, I was listening and thinking about, and I thought about this before, about, well, what happens to your prayers? You know that in the book of Revelation, at God's throne, just right there, there's a, a, a vase, and it describes it by words of great value of gold and everything. And what does God do? He takes the prayers of you, his saints, and he puts them in that bowl. You read that in the book of Revelation. God keeps those little notes. 
I know I have notes from my children. I keep them. I treasure them. God is waiting to hear from you. He's got those little notes. And it's in the, again, in the, later in the book of Revelation, it says that by the power of the prayers of God's saints, when Jesus comes again, he'll come in that power. He'll come in the power of prayer, and he'll come in the power of his word. The word, the sword, protects on one side, and on the other side it judges. That's what I believe that he is saying here in this Hebrew text that it is the divider, but it is also the judge. And what does it say when Jesus comes? What? He's going to judge by what? A sword? In Revelation, again, it talks about the, the word, doesn't it? About the sword, that he's going to judge the world with the sword, by the word of my mouth. The word is powerful, and words have impact, don't they, on us? You bet they do. Imagine the words of somebody, just a friend, a word of encouragement, and how that can build us up, can't it? Just a word sometimes, all it takes. Or a smile. If you smiled at someone today, you have blessed them. If you have looked at someone today, you have blessed them because you're a Christian. If you have spoken to someone today, you have not only blessed them, you have honored them and blessed them with God's word. Then, in second. Timothy, the fourth chapter, as we've looked at Hebrews, look at Timothy. And Timothy was a young man who was taught the word, wasn't he? At a very, very young age. And as Jesus said, have you not read, and that's in I think, Matthew 12, chapter 19, chapter 20, and I believe 21. Jesus himself relied upon the word, on the scripture, on God's word, upon his word as well. And how important and significant that word is, and how that we need to come to know God's word. Know it in the sense of experiencing it. And the encouragement that we can find in it. But that takes daily nourishment and daily strengthening, doesn't it? of the word. Survey after survey is showing of the declining knowledge that people have of God's word, but especially how few people in the church are reading God's word. Some cases it's as high, and this is sad to say, that it's only 30% that would read the Bible on a weekly basis, and even lower that we'd read it on a daily or constant basis. We're being bombarded, aren't we, with so much. And how many opportunities now we have for the Bible? Uh, we can listen to it. There are programs. And there are people that are hungry all over the world for it. I chair a board, Bibles for Mission, and they s receive a lot of things and clothing and it just it's amazing amount of stuff that we have isn't it and it's resold and the money is then sent and is buying scripture last year it was I think it was over a million pieces of scriptures were placed in people's hands and it's fascinating to see people line up and pleading for the word give me the word can i have the word do you have another one? Can I have one for someone else in my family? Read the word. But Timothy and Paul, what a relationship they'd had. And Paul is saying, look, Timothy, just keep at the word. I, I know that there will be lots of other things that you'll be doing, and I know they will take you away from it. And that's the, the bane of ministry sometimes. We get caught up so much in doing other things. And it can be a busy life. It, it's a life in ministry of 50, 60 hours some weeks, and sometimes even more than that. And you just never know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But Paul is, is warning Timothy... Be careful. 
And even in Bible college, there's a great danger there of so many people coming to Bible college or going to Bible college, stop reading the Bible. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound right, does it? That's, you think, well, why, why would you be going to a college or going to a church and stop reading the Bible? Well, it becomes a textbook, doesn't it? If you're not careful. It, it can become something to study. And have a many scholars and commentaries that we have, don't we, on that, and how scholars sometimes have led us astray in, okay, this could be possible, and that could be possible, and there it is directly in God's Word. Let's take the Word as the Word. And Paul is saying to Timothy, he said, Timothy, be careful. Be careful, Timothy. Watch yourself. Be careful, Timothy. They'll want to have their ears tickled. That's a funny word, isn't it? Anyone here ticklish? <laughs> but it, it just tell them what they want to hear. There's a lot of that going on. A lot of books are being written. And I, there's a lot of good material and a lot of good preachers on television and wherever else. But, you know, the first thing I do, I look to see what their income was last year. And as I've said, I think at Mary Harbor some time ago, I said, you know, I'll give them the first million. But when they start owning jets, and they start with their incomes in their houses being at eight and nine million dollars, look, I must have been 50 before I had my first five million. What happens? And how many have we seen fallen to the dollar, haven't we? Been taken captive by it. This world is not our home. We are not of this world, Paul is saying and encouraging Timothy not to tickle their ears because he said they'll turn to myths and stories. Stick with the word. And then <laughs> Paul says, Timothy, look, I've taught you. I've molded you for God's word. Preach the word. And that was what I got hammered into me in college by Mr. Norris. And he couldn't let it go. And when we graduated, we got a Bible. And when we graduated from my home church, didn't they put in that, preach the word? And Paul says, Timothy, it's not just the word, but it's the character of the teacher. Your mom and your grandmother, they taught you this word. Timothy, you're going to be held accountable. Timothy, Timothy, you've been given a great privilege. Preach the word. Timothy, you've been given a great example. Your mom, your grandmother, Timothy, it's the word. And so Paul just burned that into the mind and the heart of Timothy. It's the word. And we need to look deep into our dividing soul and spirit to see where we are in our relationship with Christ that we are not of this world, and it is the Word. The two-edged sword. One day we will stand before God, and we will be judged by His Word. But as He said, it's the character of the teacher. Read the Word. Feed the soul. Are you weak? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Read the word. Just any time this week, just pick up the word. Read the word. Read the word. Thy word is truth.